Well, hi everybody, it's uh, Dr. Hunter here, ready to talk about chapter two in your bioethics text. And the uh, subject for today is moral theories. We're going to be talking about um, some of the classic moral theories in uh, ethical philosophy and uh, some of the uh, uh, things that we are going to do with these ethical theories as we apply them in bioethics. Um, so let's just talk about a moral theory first of all, and the key term here is explanation. Moral theories help explain why an action is right or wrong, or a person uh, is good or bad, or a person's character is good or bad. Um, and that's the, that's the power of a moral theory. Just like, for example, in, uh, in scientific theories, so you have the heliocentric theory of the uh, of the solar system's arrangement, and it explains things like planetary movements, especially the odd phenomena that uh, that happen in the sky. That you know other types of theories, the geocentric theory in particular, uh, have a difficult time explaining. And so the heliocentric theory, tested by evidence, and um, is uh, has more explanatory power um, than other competing theories. Uh, in fact, there would be no competing theories because they would fail the test of being um, demonstrable in the way that the heliocentric theory does. So in the, a similar kind of way, uh, what we're looking for when we're talking about moral theory is the explanatory power then of a, moral, of a given moral theory for things like you know, the I mentioned here on the slide why an action is right or wrong, or what is it? What is the what is the right making feature of an action or wrong making feature of an action? What is the the good making feature of a person's character, uh, and so on? What is it that makes that person good or bad? That's what a moral theory should do. Okay, um, so let's move on to um, our next. Uh, our next slide here. Um, now, the theory is not the final authority when we're doing, uh, uh, trying to solve a moral problem and we're deliberating about a moral dilemma, for example. Um, so, the, uh, the it's not enough to simply cite a moral principle from a theory uh, or a rule from a theory and then say, Poop, problem solved, that's what you do. No, uh, to properly deliberate, to come to a specific judgment about the rightness of an action, for example, you have to conduct uh, a deliberation. And this will, if you think back to our previous discussion about moral arguments, you'll see something familiar here, and that is a deliberation involves both the general uh, theory, principles, and so on, and particular, um, and that arrives at a considered judgment. Okay, so there's no mechanical procedure for doing this, unlike, say, you know, in applying uh, a scientific theory, say, the theory of gravitation, uh, to resolve some question or problem about a falling body, for example. Um, the the kind of application of the theory is very different uh, in moral theory because it requires this deliberative uh, aspect. Okay, um, so we're talking here about the um, uh, beginning part of chapter 2, page 34 to 35. Just setting the stage now to get into the specific theories themselves. Okay, um, the, the most influential theories um, are uh, categorized in under these two headings. First, there's the consequentialist theory. Um, utilitarianism is a form we'll talk about. And it asserts that the rightness of actions depends solely on their consequences. What are the effects of the action? A deontological theory, also just a non-consequentialist theory, is um, says that the rightness of actions is determined partly or entirely by their intrinsic value. Okay, so 
there's a very different, it's not looking at the consequences, it's looking at the intrinsic value of the action. Um, so rightness depends on the kind of actions that they are, not on how much good they produce in deontological theory. So a consequentialist theory would say, for example, this dealing is wrong because it causes more harm than it does good. Uh, deontological, deontological theory might agree that the stealing is, is wrong, but that it's inherently wrong regardless of whether the consequences are good or bad. Okay, So these are the two families of uh, moral theories, or at least the two major ones that we'll be looking at. There, there are certainly others. So within consequentialism, there are uh, the uh, most common form of consequentialism is utilitarianism. And there are um, uh, three, or not three, there's two different forms of it. But let's stick to what utilitarianism as a species of the consequentialist theory. So right actions are those that result in the most beneficial balance of good over bad consequences for everyone involved. You need to notice there what you've got in that definition to unpack that a bit. Um, you're talking about the most beneficial balance of good over bad. So it recognizes that consequences are complicated, that it's rarely, if ever, 100% good or 100% bad in their effects. Okay, so you're looking at the overall balance of the consequences of the effects. Um, but then for whom is the next question? Not just the person making the decision, not just the person directly affected by the decision, but for everyone who is involved. Okay, the, the person acting as well as the person being acted upon and all of the uh, relevant uh, persons sur uh, surrounding those two actors, uh, if there are in fact two. Okay, so that is, uh, that's an important, that's an important uh, feature of utilitarianism. Philosophers call that optimific, the idea that the uh, the beneficial balance of good over bad for everyone involved. That's called the optimific consequence. You don't have to know that term. Um, but that's uh, but that's utilitarianism. Okay, so within utilitarianism, there's two different kinds. We're going to look at the uh, we're going to look at the good produced by individual actions. If so, that's act utilitarianism. And you'll find many of the utilitarian theories are this. Um, classic version is put by Mill um, and and others. Uh, let's see if I want to say anything about act utilitarianism beyond what's there. Um, so the, the idea there is that uh, if I had uh, formatted that definition a little better, I would have bolded individual because that's the uh, that's the key idea there in act utilitarianism. It is uh, it's the relative good produced by individual actions. Um, so you're looking at an act in a particular situation and whether it produces, on balance, a greater uh, uh, greater balance of good over bad than alternative acts that one might have taken. Okay, so you have to then weigh the consequences of the all the possible individual actions that could be taken in that situation okay so you have to look at possible acts not just the one that you are considering or uh, or considering to reject okay now uh, there's another way to do this and that is by uh, the theory known as rule utilitarianism so a right action is one that conforms to a rule that if followed consistently would create for everyone involved the most beneficial balance of good over bad. So there you're not looking at the, uh, you're not judging the rightness or wrongness of individual acts, but you're looking at the rules governing types of actions, categories, families of actions. Um, so it's uh, a right action then is one that conforms to that rule that then has this consequence of creating um, the beneficial balance of good over bad for everyone concerned. Okay, so those are uh, a brief discussion of utilitarianism. It is discussed on pages 36 through 38. 
and um, there's a nice little sidebar uh, discussion of the um, the um, uh, John Stuart Mill, who is a famous formulator of utilitarianism, not the founder of it, but um, most popular most popular philosopher um, who wrote a little book called Utilitarianism back in the 19th century. But there's a little sidebar there about um, how utilitarianism and the golden rule um, are, in his view, consistent. Okay, uh, so you can have a look at that as sort of a, a specific example of how uh, rule utilitarianism would think. Uh, okay, so that's utilitarianism. Let's move to Kant. Um, Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher um, who is uh, who wrote uh, three massive texts that philosophers call the critiques. So the first um, is, uh, sorry, the first one is not the one we're talking about. The second one is what we're talking about, a critique of practical reason, and that has to do with ethics. Um, so his uh, categorical imperative is probably one of the most uh, well-known uh, statements. And uh, an imperative, just so you know this, an imperative is a command to do something. Okay, so that's what an imperative means. It's imperative that you uh, sign up for my class, right? That means it is a command to do something. Um, it's categorical if it applies without exception and without any regard to particular needs or purposes. Okay, so uh, a categorical imperative then says do this regardless, no exceptions. Okay. Um, there is uh, another form of imperative that Kant talks about. It's called hypothetical imperative, and it's a, it's a command to do something. It's an imperative, but it is um, if we are aiming to achieve some particular ends that we're after. So, for example, if you want to get paid, work hard. Okay, that's a hypothetical imperative. Um, okay, so let's see here. So yeah, uh, Kant thought that through the uh, considered application of reason and reflection, we can derive our duties um, from a single moral principle. This one here, the, the categorical imperative, act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Okay, so if you... Uh, uh, you know, it, so the application of a moral law for Kant has logical implications. So they imply general rules, maxims, okay, of conduct. If you tell a lie for financial gain, um, you're in effect acting according to a maxim like, hey, it's okay to lie to someone when doing so benefits you financially. Okay, that's the maxim that you're acting under when you say when you tell a lie for financial gain. Okay, that's the consequence of your action. <clears throat> Sorry, that is the, the duty that is implied then. So now the question is whether the maxim corresponding to the action is a legitimate moral law. And to find out, you can test this. You test it by asking, can I consistently will that the maxim become a universal a law applicable to everyone? including me. So if everyone consistently acted on this maxim, uh, would we be willing to have them do so? All right. If you could do this, then the action described by the maxim is morally permissible. If it's not, then it's prohibited. Okay. So uh, try to um, you know, think about uh, a, a lying promise, and your author discusses this on page 39. Um, suppose you need to borrow money from a friend, okay? And, uh, but it's money that you know you can never pay back, but you say, uh, in order to get the loan, you lie, and you say, oh yeah, yeah, I totally promise to repay you that money. Um, now, is, and you really, let's say you really need it, okay, you really need the money, but is it morally permissible? All right, under under a deontological the, under Kant's deontological theory, um, you simply ask consistent. Can you consistently 
um, will that maxim of your action to become a universal law? Okay, so you ask then, what would happen if everyone did this? Made lying promises, in other words. Whenever you need to borrow money that you can't pay back, make a lying promise to repay. Okay, so what would happen if everyone did that? Um, if you act in accordance with that maxim, then everyone would be making lies to obtain loans, and everyone would know that the promises are worthless, right? Um, so there would be no practice of making loans on promises then that would cease. So if you end up then applying such a, uh, a maxim as this one, you know, if you need money, make a lying promise. If you apply that consistently, then you create a contradiction. That's the outcome. Uh, if everyone made lying promises, promise making itself would cease to exist. Okay, promise making itself would cease to exist. You cannot consistently will the maxim to become a universal law. So your duty is clear. Making a lying promise to borrow money is morally wrong. Okay, so it's this is a, a more challenging moral theory to apply, but if you get this idea down, um, and the author's done a nice job of giving you several examples of how you do this on page 39 and 40. So do have a close look at that and understand what the categorical imperative is and how it works to figure out what you ought to do and what you ought not to do under this theory, okay? So natural law theory, another, um, another historically common theory, uh, we'll say something about that in a second. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the view that uh, right actions are those that conform to moral standards discerned in nature through human reason. Um, so notice the role of reason here as well as, as we saw also in Kant's theory. Um, so the, uh, the idea here is that, um, and there's a, a principle underlying this view, and that is that uh, nature is teleological. Okay, so there's a big word. Uh, you can certainly look it up, but, that, but it's the idea that nature is directed to a certain end or to, uh, uh, to achieving certain purposes, uh, some goals. So there is a, a natural way things are, uh, natural processes and functions that accord with natural law, um, and those things show how things should be as well. Okay, so that expresses natural law. So the prime duty of human beings then is to guide your lives in accordance with those natural laws. Okay, so um, implicit in this theory is the idea that humans are capable of uh, sustained and effective reasoning, that, that we're rational beings, um, that we can perceive the workings of nature, um, that we can determine the natural inclinations of humans, um, that we can recognize the implications for uh, morally permissible actions and so on. Um, so this, uh, uh, this theory, like most of the theories that we're talking about uh, in the course, of means that moral laws are objective, um, that since they can be found in nature, they're not dependent on the mind uh, to exist, um, but they're um, but they are to be discovered, just like um, uh, scientific laws uh, can be discovered uh, through careful study. So uh, natural law has a background in uh, religious uh, as well as non-religious uh, views. So you can uh, look at the two, the two views there. Um, most philosophers, um, actually this isn't quite true, I was about to say, most philosophers um, doing natural law theory today are non-theistic, but I'm not quite sure that's true, as true as it was, say, 20, 30 years ago, but um, I could be wrong about that. Um, so there's an important principle in natural law theory um, 
um, that came about because of dilemmas that um, that arise, and that is that moral principles do often conflict um, where it seems like we are required to fulfill two uh, two or more duties simultaneously that aren't compatible with each other. For example, if you're trying to save someone's life, um, that may require you to tell a lie to save their life. Um, and uh, you know the, the, the alternative is that you have a duty to tell the truth, but if you tell the truth, then you know it would cause their death. Um, so that puts you in a dilemma. You can't do both. Um, so the moral theory, as all moral theories, but natural law theory in particular, has to address this problem. Um, and so some do by saying that, <clears throat> let's see if this is our next one. No, it's not. Um, it's uh, mentioned, though, <clears throat> that when you have moral uh, duties that conflict, you have to decide which ones override the others. And the um, uh, you have to figure out you know, whether maybe all moral duties are prima facie, okay, that they are, um, that there are, that, that all moral duties are non-absolute, in other words, that, that all, all moral duties admit of exceptions, okay, that's one strategy, but uh, natural law, like most moral theories, also posit absolute duties, and um, so you can't take that option you can't take the option that all moral duties are prima facie. Instead, um, natural law resolves it by ap appealing to what's called the doctrine of double effect. And so you, ha you should have a look at that. But it gives tests to figure out um, which action would be judged morally permissible. Um, and so you have a look at that on page 41. I'm not going to go into it here. And then there's a specific example the author gives, which is really quite good, um, about you know what one ought to do uh, about treating uh, an ill person, um, you know, for whom life-sustaining illnesses are are useless, and so um, these reach very specific verdicts about what is uh, the morally correct thing to do by applying the doctrine of double effect. Okay, um, let's see if there's anything else I want to mention there. Okay, so yeah, pages uh, 40, 42 for natural law, contractarianism, uh, or social contract theory, as it's often called. Um, so moral or political theories, these are moral political theories based on the idea of a social contract or arrangement, agreement, among individuals for mutual advantage. <clears throat> so this is another family of theories, um, just like consequentialism and duty-based theories or deontological theories. And your author talks about uh, probably the most influential contract theorist is John Rawls, and talking about um, how uh, a just society should structure itself to ensure a fair distribution of rights, obligations, duties, advantages, um, you know, for, and, and promote social cooperation. Um, so that is. Uh, 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 discussed here, and there's a couple uh, important ideas within his answer. And one is this idea of the original position. So you have a group of self-interested, rational um, individuals who come together, and and also the word normal. So I guess that means like fully functional, rational, and um, self-interested beings who come together and choose the principles that are going to determine the uh, basic rights and duties of their society. Okay, um, so uh, how, do they, how do they do that in a way that's going to be fair and impartial uh, as possible? Okay, so this is where the idea of a veil of ignorance is applied. And so this is where all the things that are incidental to uh, your identity are stripped away uh, and made not consequential. So things like your social status, your economic status, uh, your race, your sex, your class, uh, your abilities, your talents, all that kind of stuff, your intelligence, um, all of that is stripped away um, where 
by certain way, I mean, no one knows what those things are behind the veil of ignorance about you, and you don't know those things about others, okay? So instead, all you're doing is you're focusing on um, your, your identity as a rational and self-interested individual, okay, who is ignorant of everyone else's status in society, and, and really, ideally, uh, you're ignorant of your own. So you're not going to, in that, in that case, if you're behind the veil of ignorance, you're not going to put in place principles, laws, that are going to disadvantage any group, right? Because you might be uh, doing that to yourself then, because um, you might be a member of that group. So you won't single out all those incidental features of identity and and make them somehow build them into uh, the, the policies and the principles of the society. Okay, so you're going to choose as far as possible principles that are uh, unbiased, non-discriminatory, okay? Um, so whatever agreements are reached then in that original position behind the veil of ignorance will also be fair. Um, the principles will be just, according to this theory. Okay, so um, there's, uh, there's more to say about uh, Rawls' theory, which you need to look at on pages 42 to 43, but that's the basic idea and some of the sort of unique principles behind it. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that's relevant for our course is we can ask the question, is the healthcare system just or unjust? Okay, that is a great question for contract theory to try to answer because you can apply um, uh, Rawls's principles to determine uh, whether it is or not. Um, and that might be an exercise for a later reading. Okay, so virtue ethics is, um, uh, is not dealing with what all the other theories that we've talked about so far are, is dealing, have dealt with, and that is the idea of obligation, what we're obligated to do. Uh, what we're obligated not to do. Uh, they're emphasizing the rightness of actions, um, the duties of, of moral agents. So virtue ethics is a different animal altogether. Um, so it has to do with um, developing virtuous character. So you become the sort of person who performs virtuous actions. Okay? And that's, that's what developing virtuous character aims to do. So the rightness of actions comes about by developing a certain kind of character, uh, and that's the key to the moral life. Okay, it's not about uh, the, uh, you know, finding the right moral rule uh, to, to test, you know, uh, 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 in moral dilemmas, but it becomes about developing this character, and so that um, uh, the virtuous character is one whose moral conduct um, and dispositions to act morally are going to be uh, developed. And then for those characters, they become standards and models of excellence, of, of excellence of behavior and choice and action. Okay, so um, let me see if there's anything I want to add to that. Yeah, Aristotle is the philosopher most associated with virtue ethics for very good reason, and that uh, you can look at the concepts there. Um, so virtue ethics um, uh, is, is doing more, in, in some sense it's harder, because it's doing more than just having us look at moral rules uh, and you know sort of size up our performance against those rules, but instead um, it's asking us to aspire to moral excellence um, so that we are uh, cultivating uh, values, uh, virtues that are going to make us better people. Um, and that, you know, is just not part of the, the moral theories that we've just been looking at. So virtue ethics then is goal-directed because that's the goal, but it's a very different goal than the deontological theory we're talking about, which had to do with our moral obligations. Um, this is um, this is not rule-guided at all. So what are some of the moral virtues? Well, benevolence, 
uh, uh, magnet, magnanimity, fairness, honesty, loyalty, uh, compassion, and things like that. Um, you would be familiar with these, of course. Um, so these are then ideals um, that we are always then striving to attain if we're uh, virtue ethicists. Okay, um, let's see. There are other virtues that are non-moral in character, and the author talks about those. Okay, so the virtue ethicist is also concerned with motivation, so it becomes not simply a matter of uh, possessing the right virtues, um, but having the, the proper motivations then to uh, use them, to uh, that accompany them. Uh, so we, we need to act from virtue, and uh, that means acting with appropriate motives. Okay, so ethics of care is also a distinct uh, moral perspective, and this arose out of uh, feminist theories, and uh, it also is uh, a challenge to the, uh, the the more common moral theories that we were looking at earlier. Um, so the heart of the moral life in the ethics of care is feeling for and caring for those with whom you have a special intimate connection. So virtues and feelings uh, central to our personal relationships, um, things like empathy, uh, compassion, love, sympathy, friendship, uh, I'm sorry, fidelity, those are the heart of the moral life under the ethics of care. Um, and and those, uh, those for especially physicians and nurses, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, your, uh, your author goes into more of the uh, uh, background in feminism uh, behind the ethics of care. And uh, the key figure there is Carol Gilligan. And so she is quoted at length, and, um, and your author does a nice job of explaining uh, her position on the care perspective. So do have a look at that. Um, let's see. And so since uh, we have mentioned in feminist ethics, we should... Uh, take a look at that um, as a, a distinct kind of approach to morality. And so this one is, uh, although, it in, um, although it's connected to the ethics of care, uh, feminist ethics in particular is, is aimed at advancing women's interests and correcting past injustices uh, that women have suffered. And so um, in general, it downplays the uh, role of moral principles and traditional ethical concepts like those we we looked at earlier. <clears throat> and instead, it looks at uh, the social realities, uh, our relationships uh, between people, uh, the institutions that we uh, we uh, are members of, the power arrangements that exist, uh, and how, how they're distributed in society. And moral reflection has to be dealing with those types of realities. Um, and that is, um, let's see, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, and one of, the, one of the interesting features of feminist ethics as a result of this is you know, just like it's not looking at some of those uh, moral principles and traditional concepts that we were talking about earlier, it also tends, not all of them, but most of them reject the idea of a moral agent. And that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, difference, is that, and the, the argument is that, that a moral agent is just this abstract individual um, and has these uh, ideal properties like perfect autonomy, um, you know, has uh, uh, values and motivations disconnected from other individuals. So this idea, like in, in contract theory, of the rational, perfectly rational and self-interested individual, um, are, you know, those are fictions and beca because abstract. And so that is, uh, uh, that is regarded as those kinds of ideas are regarded as impediments to uh, uh, moral theory, not moral theory, but moral uh, improvement and determining uh, the rightness and wrongness of actions. Okay, and so um, 
let's see, I think really that's it for surveying the moral theories um, that you know are going to appear uh, as we are reading both in the chapters and in the instructional part of the text, but especially when it comes to the supplemental readings that are, you know, the, the second week uh, within a given chapter. Um, you will be able to, uh, you need to be able, I should say, develop the ability to recognize these different theories and when they are discussed. Um, as in that, that will help you understand the perspective from which the author is writing. Um, and, all, and, and a lot of these will will look at, will consider multiple uh, theoretical perspective. So you'll get to see them, you know, you know, try out utilitarianism and then try out Kant and try out contract theory, try out feminist ethics. And some will be explicit about doing that. Others you will just have to recognize the principles that we've covered in this chapter. Okay, <coughs> so almost done here. Um, a term here, and unfortunately this is, uh, uh, this term is, um, has multiple meanings. So casuistry is, uh, if you look at it in a dictionary, the first definition is going to be uh, you know, something that um, it's uh, reasoning that is clever but uh, tricky. In other words, it's it's not necessarily true, um, and it's there's a term for that in philosophy it's called sophism uh, or sophistry, and that is uh, you know trying to uh, persuade or win an argument, but not doing so with uh, with good reasons and sound reasoning. So they're they're often effective arguments. Casuistry is uh, often effective, but not necessarily valid reasoning. So uh, that's the first meaning that you'll find of casuistry. And let's set that aside because that's not the one we're talking about in our course. We're talking about the use of cases and analogies um, rather than universal principles and theories to perform our moral reasoning. So we, we need to know the, the moral theories from which a perspective is uh, tried out. But when it comes to uh, you know, reaching considered moral judgments, casuistry is, is using cases and analogies to you know, maybe identify a paradigm case that we can use as an exemplar for future similar kinds of cases. And so you find that, for example, in legal reasoning, uh, that legal reasoning uses this all the time, where if you have, you've heard of the idea of precedent, you know, in legal reasoning, where say the Supreme Court is de deliberating on uh, the constitutionality of some issue, and one of the first things they do is they look at precedent, they look at previous cases that are similar, uh, that took up similar kinds of concepts and problems, and what their reasoning was and what their considered judgment was, and that carries a lot of force then for the judgments they continue to make. So that, you know, those legal precedents then become paradigms for future decisions. That's how casuistry works. Um, <clears throat> so that is uh, really all to say about that, and just that's so that you know what our method is going to be in the course and in your readings. Um, your author will always bring it back to uh, examples and, and cases and analogies to, uh, to illustrate whatever the moral issue is that's trying to be resolved. Okay, so then we want to be able then to consider, um, uh, we want to be able to weigh moral theories against one another, you know, in, in these different cases. And so how, and the, the, some will reach different uh, results than others and say, we ought to act in, in this way. And the next theory might say, we need to act in another way, a different way. So we want to be able to evaluate, um, well, which moral theory gives us the, the better answer. And so, um, you know, it's, there has to be a way to judge the worth of what the moral theory says, and the, this is where these criteria come in. Um, so, you know, there's an analogy your author makes with scientific criteria of adequacy, which is helpful. So this has to do with the explanatory power bit. Um, but 
the uh, the criterion of moral adequacy um, means that we have these conceptual yardsticks that we can use to measure the adequacy of, of, of different theories against one another and see whether the, the application of that theory measures up to the standards um, of these critical uh, ideas of these criteria. Okay, so your author uh, has these called out in a box on page 49 and then there is a, a really uh, in-depth discussion of them which I leave to you to do but the first criterion here is consistency with our considered moral judgments. Okay, so any plausible uh, moral theory that uh, has to be consistent with the data that it's supposed to explain. Um, so that data includes our considered moral judgments, uh, you know, our common sense, morally speaking. So, you know, when we arrive at uh, we conduct these moral deliberations and we do them free as possible of bias or self-interest or other kinds of distorting influences, um, you, know, you, you want to grant those judgments some respect, right? Um, and so when you're doing moral theorizing, you, you recognize that, yeah, those judgments can still be fallible, but they carry moral weight. Um, because there has been diligence applied in doing the in conducting the moral deliberation. Okay, so the criterion is let's trust those considered moral judgments uh, unless we have good reasons to doubt them. Okay, and so any moral theory that's seriously inconsistent with our considered moral judgment is is going to be regarded as badly flawed. Okay, um, maybe fatally so. So. That is how you use uh, criterion number one. Uh, criterion number two is consistency with the facts of the moral life. Um, so think about background knowledge here. Um, so moral background knowledge, um, the uh, sort of basic inescapable features of moral life, um, you know, that, yeah, we can we can be mistaken in our moral beliefs, and the um, uh, and still give reasons for accepting moral beliefs. Um, and we do that. Um, I don't want to say this. I'm not, not, not entirely convinced of the way this is expressed. Is very good. Um, so, the obvious facts of moral life would be that, for example, appealing back to criterion one, that our moral common sense is often a good guide um, and that, that, uh, that we're, not, we're not so morally obtuse that you know, we, we get it wrong in some of uh, the basic moral judgments that we make. So that, that would be a, a sort of obvious fact of the moral life. You can think back to the example of the lying promises and, and you can understand how, for example, um, you know, cons consistently approving of the making of lying promises is 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 self-destructive, right? It's not only self-destructive, sorry, but it's destructive to social cohesion, to all kinds of things. Uh, and so, any theory that results then in uh, 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 the rightness of an action that is not consistent with the, with those kinds of facts in the moral life, deeply suspect them. Okay, and then criterion three is the resourcefulness in uh, moral problem solving. Um, so we need the, we need the theory to be able to go sort of beyond a specific case and to have uh, a more general application. Um, and so you, know, you see this in scientific theories all the time where a theory is derived to solve a particular problem, but then it's found that, wow, you know, it, it's useful for figuring out this other issue too. Uh, it has plausibility um, uh, to has plausibility when it comes to answering another kind of question. Um, that means it's a resourceful theory, and so moral theories too can be resourceful if they help to solve moral problems beyond just what the the particular relevant issues are within the problem that we're looking at. Um, 
So yeah, if they help us resolve conflicts among moral principles, for example, in judgments, um, if they help us test and correct our moral intuitions, which obviously can be wrong sometimes, um, if they help us understand the point of morality itself, uh, that's a resourceful moral theory. Um, and so a theory that lacks that ability, um, then is, if it lacks that resourcefulness, then it's probably not going to be that useful, probably not credible. Okay, so that is the, um, the, uh, the heart of the, the, the casuistry and criteria of adequacy section of your reading, and your author then goes on to apply this in utilitarianism and Kantian ethics. So have a look at how he does that. That is, um, that's it for chapter two. Thanks for hanging in there, and good luck with this week's reading and quiz. I'll talk to you later.